Well, hello everybody. I'm Downriver Darren, and I distill down the great books of conservatism. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about one book in particular, but also to examine how the whole far-reaching conservative philosophy of its author, Roger Scruton, perhaps shores up with uh, what writer, poet, and conservationist Wendell Berry is saying about things like place, particularity, lo uh, localization, beauty, natural beauty in particular, and culture. Um, we might rightly call Wendell Berry the uh, <laughs> can't wear sunglasses on. the poet of place. Um, so if we call Wendell Berry the poet of place, we should call Roger Scruton the philosopher of home. Although in doing so, we, we uh, risk making these heavyweight champions of the permanent things seem too small. But though these two thinkers are likely to remind us that small is beautiful, their ideas have made a massive impact. These are formidable defenders of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and when humble conservative bookmen assert that we stand on the shoulders of giants, it is Scruton and Barry that are two of the titans we're talking about. Now, you may not be surprised to learn that the poet of place and the philosopher of home uh, live in the same neighborhood, metaphorically speaking, uh, but in reality, they come from different places. Uh, Barry is a Kentuckian. Scruton is an Englishman. However, with our favorite Michigander, Russell Kirk, they uh, share a similar love of home, our place in it, and our duty to it. These thinkers are kindred spirits and intellectual first cousins of, uh, who share the great Irish statesman Edmund Burke as their philosoph philosophical great-grandfather. So perhaps, Andy, it is uh, no better place than to be talking about the roots of um, conservatism and Edmund Burke here in the Irish hills of Michigan. Um, the book, how to, how to Talk Seriously About the Planet, the Case for Environmental Conservatism, written in 2012. Let's start with a unifying principle. Why are conservatives and conservationists natural bedfellows? That's a good question, isn't it? For my buck, Burke has the best answer. He tells us that we should be stewards and that it is our duty to enhance, not to exhaust what we've inherited and to pass on that inheritance to our children in a condition better than we have received it. Now, I learned this principle in the Boy Scouts when packing up our campsites, campsites before moving out. Boys, we gotta leave it. we've got to leave this place better than we found it, our scoutmasters would remind us in a way that reverberates through time and all place. And we realize that in the core of our souls, that in this advice there is something good and true and beautiful in this way to live, to leave the world better than we found it, to pay it forward, as Bo Schembechler's mentor would often say. Come on. What we're discussing here is the hereditary principle, the great primeval contract of eternal society that Edmund Burke first outlined in his great groundbreaking book, uh, book Revolutions, uh, Reflections on the Revolutions in France. Burke is the, the great grandfather of the conservative movement, and uh, it's this, this, this eternal contract uh, that he describes in, uh, in Reflections is offered in contrast to Rousseau's social contract. And even a Lockean view, it's, a, it's offered in uh, opposition to a Lockean view of the matter. Uh, and the time has proven Burke to be right about this. Burke wrote that society is indeed a contract, but it is a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. Kirk called this concept a venerable eternal chain of duty linking great and obscure. And it is uh, this core principle of inheritance and stewardship that links Scruton, Kirk, and Barry with Burke. So uh, Burke's true standards for a statement, statesman were a disposition to preserve and an ability to improve. A disposition to preserve and ability to, prove, uh, and to improve. Everything else is vulgar, he says, and parallels, uh, perilous in its execution. Burke excoriates those life renters, as he calls them, those temporary possessors of power who are unmindful, quote, of what they have received from their ancestors or of what is due to their posterity. They commit waste on the inheritance by destroying at their pleasure the whole original fabric of society, hazarding to leave those who come after them a ruin rather than a habitation. 
and teaching these successors as little to respect their contrivances as they have themselves respected the institutions of their forefathers. By this unprincipled faculty of floating fancies or fashions, changing the state is often in as much, and it is in many ways, the whole chain and continuity of the Commonwealth would be broken, and no generation could link to one another. Men would become little better than the flies of summer. The famous flies of summer, quote, that's Burke at his most dystopian, um, and it echoes down through T.S. Eliot's Wastelands, through Bradbury's 451, that if ever man lost piety for our forefathers in the house of wisdom they've instituted, they would become little better than the flies of summer, mere appetite. People will not look forward to posterity who never look back to their ancestors, Burke tells us. They stop paying it forward and instead stop to feast and devour. Now here we are in America seeing the largest generation, some 78 million baby boomers are retiring, all of their entitlements are already running in the red, we got an 82 trillion dollar unfunded liability in the Medicare, and yet these programs are third rails of politics that promise to kill anyone who attempts to talk about their unsustainability. Uh, generational theft is, by the way, not good stewardship. <laughs> Conservatism and conservation are natural bedfellows, Scruton tells us, because they are two aspects of a single long-term policy, which is that of husbanding resources, husbanding resources, and ensuring their renewal. The resources include three different kinds of capital. One is social capital, embodied in laws, customs, institutions, our churches, our spirit, our community values, that, that public spirit. These are this is that unwritten constitution about which Russell Kirk, Russell Kirk wrote so eloquently about that unwritten constitution that sustains our formal written documents. That's the first kind, social capital. The second kind is material capital. That is our fossil fuels, our, our minerals, our material um, uh, environment. And then thirdly, economic capital, of course, is contained in a free but law-governed economy. Oh, sorry. According to... Uh, According to this view, the purpose of politics is not to rearrange society in the interests of some overarching vision or ideal, such as equality, liberty, or fraternity. It is to maintain a, vil a vigilant resistance to entropic forces, entropic forces that threaten our social and eco ecological equilibrium. I knew I wasn't going to be able to say that even when I wrote that. Ecological, equ equ <laughs> ecological equilibrium. <laughs> The destructive forces can come from below, as in the case of social nihilism, or they can come from above, <coughs> as in the form of top-down edicts from, from big government. The goal is to pass on to future generations, and meanwhile, to maintain and to enhance the order of which we are merely the temporary trustees. So whereas cons uh, conservationists attempt to conserve and enhance our natural ecology, social conservatives are trying to serve and enhance our social ecology, natural and social ecology. I think this is very helpful for us to look at it this way because this allows for us to find that seabed of agreement, that common ground of agreement that can lead to the shared road forward in solutions. And so, um, um, again, conservationists are trying to protect our wilderness and our ecological order. Conservatives are trying to defend the beleaguered moral order that was, until just a few decades ago, passed from generation to generation as a matter of course. Environmentalists and conservatives are both in search of the motives that will defend a shared but threatened legacy from predation by its current, by its current trustees. This is the point of conservatism, to conserve what is best and even better than we found it by refining and increasing all three kinds of social capital, again, social, material, and economic. This is why, in Scruton's estimations, greens should be conservatives. These are the shared aims and can be the starting point. Here, my friends, is the genius of Scruton's book, How to Think Seriously About the Planet, A Case for Environmental Conservatism. By showing how conservative solutions are actually better at preserving our natural ecology, he opens the door and shows how conservative solutions are also better at preserving and enhancing our social ecology. So it's really, uh, really brilliant what he's done here. Um, you find yourself wondering throughout this book what a progressive at Greenpeace who's reading it might think uh, in the many places where Scruton's Socratic method makes clear that they cannot reach their ends 
by the means they've chosen. But, but Scruton's not pulling any punches here either. He's not doing it just to get along. He clearly sees the conflict of visions, which is a term I'm stealing from Thomas Sowell, perhaps you know. He clearly <coughs> sees the conflict of visions between the conservative and progressive. He says, quote, the distinction between the left and right is wrongly described by modern commentators as a distinction between the state and the market. It's not. He tells us instead we ought to look at the left-right distinction between two human types. The one, seeing politics as the collective pursuit of an egalitarian goal. The other, seeing it as a free association between individuals in which absent generations and present hierarchies have a place. Scruton also doesn't pull punches against the globalizing anarcho-capitalists. And it is here then, I think, that Scruton really begins to show how conservatism is neither a libertarian anarcho-capitalist idea, nor is it progressive collectivism, but rather a third point that's not on a line, but it's rather a third point, like on a triangle, that, that conservatism is. Consider this. He says, environmentalists have been habituated to see conservatism as the ideology of free enterprise and to see free enterprise as an assault on the Earth's resources with no motive beyond short-term gain. Furthermore, there is a settled tendency on the left to confuse rational self-interest, which powers the market, with greed, which is a form of irrational excess. Those who have called themselves conservatives are, are in, in the political context are partly responsible for this misconception, for they have tended to see modern politics as a, in terms of a simple dichotomy between individual freedom on one hand and state control on the other. Scruton says, no, 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 that's not the way to look at it. <clears throat> individual freedom means economic freedom, and this in turn means freedom to exploit natural resources for financial gain. The timber merchant who cuts down a rainforest, the mining corporation that decapitates a mountain, the motor manufacturer that churns out an endless stream of cars, the cola producer that sends out a million plastic bottles each and every day, all are, or at any rate seem to be, obeying the laws of the market. And all, if they are not checked, are destroying some part of our shared inheritance. Whoa, <laughs> you know, if you're someone who strains all of the social thinking through the sieve of free market competition, you may want to uh, return your seat backs and trade tables to their upright position here. What is this? Is there something besides fascistic socialism or anarcho-capitalism? Why, yes, Virginia, there is. And in these parts, we just call it plain old uh, down-home conservatism. And that's very much what I think uh, uh, a, a way of looking at it that, uh, that Wendell Berry would approve. But before I, be, uh, before I frighten all the children, let me clarify, and let's start by alleviating some fears. Scruton says we do, we do need free enterprise and his defense of the free enterprise market system is a staunch defense indeed. But he says that we also need a rule of law that limits it. When enterprise is the prerogative of the state, the entity that controls the law is identical with the entity that has the most powerful motive to evade the law. Scruton says this is a sufficient explanation, it seems to me, of the ecological catastrophe of socialist economies. Let me read the line again. When enterprise is the prerogative of the state, the entity that controls the law is identical with the entity that has the most powerful motive to evade the law. Okay? Kind of like sounds like granting waivers for Obamacare, doesn't it? Or perhaps um, uh, Freddie and Fanny Mac, or Fanny and Freddie Mac, who uh, are enterprises of the state. Um, who evaded common sense to artificially inflate our housing sector, causing an economic crisis when the bubble burst. Our Federal Reserve monetizes debt at an alarming rate while it inflates another bubble and inflates the money supply, slowly leaking away all of our savings. So, if it's not clear, Scruton is, is saying there needs to be a, a solid wall of separation between business and state. Okay. <clears throat> No, for Scruton, the answer is not so, a socialist one. He says that history tells us that large-scale projects in the hands of bureaucrats soon cease to be accountable, and that regulations imposed by the state have side effects that often worsen what they aim to cure. The fact is that when, pop, when problems pass to government, they pass out of our hands. Okay? 
Here we have come across some other key principles of conservatism, decentralization, subsidiarity, locality, community, widely distributed social power, rather than centrally acquired political coercive power. Conservatism emphasizes historical loyalties, local identities, and the kind of long-term commitments that arises <coughs> among people by virtue of their localized and limited affections. While socialism and liberalism are inherently global in their aims, conservatism is inherently local. A defense of some pocket of some social capital against the forces of anarchic change. And it is precisely this local emphasis that uniquely suits conservatives to the task of addressing environmental problems. You see, Scruton sees the environmental problem as arising from the loss of equilibrium that ensues when people cease to understand their surroundings as a home. This law, this loss has many causes, but not least of them, is the wrong use of legislation and the fragmentation of society that comes about when bureaucrats take charge of it. The greatest danger to an environment, Scruton says, comes from the growing tendency of governments to confiscate the power and freedoms of autonomous associations and to centralize all power in their own hands. If the people can combine, they can win. Nobody is likely to take better care of one's own home than one's own self, right? Or their wife. <laughs> um, so what do these ideas remind you of that we just talked about? Let's just pause here for a second to think about this. Now, I'm, I'm reminded of Albert J. Knox's famous remark that behind every behind fascism, communism, and socialism, you, socialism, let me say this again, behind fascism, communism, and socialism, Albert J. Knox saw at base the desire to convert voluntary social power into state control, state power. To take control out of the local and put it into the central is essentially the progressive project's main aim. The difference, once again, between right and left is very visible <coughs> here. Progressives want to empower higher powers. Conservatives are the ones calling for power to the little people. Funny how it used to be that liberals in the 60s were standing up to the man and now they find themselves tailoring his suits for him. But this is inevitably what happens if you get swept up in the grand march that is the political uh, progressive project. When you're cut off from your roots and the faith of your forefathers no longer has hold on your beliefs, you're likely to throw your latent enthusiasm in with the cause that promises to solve all of our problems merely by putting the best experts and the right type of people in charge of them. Conservative think, conservatives think that people solve their own problems better than government can, and we see government causing a lot of those problems in the first place. So we want the inv individual local laboratories of democracy, and progressives see the world instead as uh, one part of one vast a political, social, global experiment. In this sorting out and coming of uh, sorting out of and coming to understanding of the two types of people, left and right, Scruton does also a tremendous service by distinguishing between the cosmopolitan and the internationalist. Cosmopolitans are home at are at home in any city. Uh, they appreciate human life in all its peaceful forms and are emotionally in touch with the customs, languages, and cultures of many people like our Lithuanian friends here. They are patriots of one country, but nationalists of many. Internationalists, by contrast, uh, wish to break down the distinctions between the people. They do not feel at home in any city since they're aliens to all. They see the world as one vast system in which everyone is equally a customer, a consumer, and a creature of wants and needs. They are happy to transplant transplant people from place to place, to abolish local attachments, to shift boundaries and customs in accordance with the inexorable tide of political need or economic progress. See, it's very interesting, isn't it? You can start to begin to detect the critique against globalized anarcho capitalism here in Scruton's remarks, right? It's not so black and white anymore, is it? The free market carries nothing. The free market cares nothing for the social order and will use whatever is expedient in attaining its goals, even bribery, or what people in Washington, D.C. call a campaign contributions. But it could get worse. We could join the EU. <laughs> those, those who first dreamed up the, the European Union were cosmopolitans. Those who are now exploiting it and shaping it are internationalists, 
We have no affection whatsoever for the identities on which it has been built. Behind the EU, pressing always for its expansion, hoping to use its legislative powers to turn the market to their favor, are the big businesses of Europe, Japan, and America, and China, and particularly the supermarket chains, the fast food franchises, the pharmaceutical companies, and the car manufacturers, the purveyors of global goods and global entertainments, who wish to make everywhere identical in order to secure a level playing field that gives maximum customs to their goods. Do you guys get this, this whole point? I think this is very key that we, we, we understand that, uh, like Chesterton said, uh, big business, there's nothing worse than big business and big government. Especially, they're, they're, they're exactly the same, especially big business. The idea that big business and big government, this is another place where progressives can find common cause with conservatives against crony capitalism. We think that's really the only thing that really united us in any way with the, uh, the Occupy movement. They were against big business that uh, uh, tilted the, the playing field in favor of them and against the mom and pop businesses. So, <clears throat> do we really want to go in this direction to lose everything that was distinctive of our histories and our traditions and to lose the loyalties that made Europe and America possible in the first place? The direction leads to nowhere, and this nowhere is the very same threat against which left-wing Okafiles mobilize in defense of local communities and the rooted ways of doing things. Another way of putting the point is that for conservatives, politics concerns the maintenance and repair of homeostatic systems, systems that correct themselves in response to destabilizing change. Markets are homeostatic systems. That's why conservatives love them. So too are traditions, customs, common laws, so are to our families, civil associations, the stuff that make up a free society. But this is not because conservatives are interested in markets and prefer market forces to government action wherever the two are rivals. But this is not because of some quasi-religious belief in the market as the ideal form of social order or the sole solution to social and political problems. Still less is this affection for market capitalism because of some cult of homo economicus, economic man, um, in the rational supposed self-interest that governs him. It is rather because conservatives look to markets as self-correcting social systems, which can confront and overcome the shocks from the outside, and in normal cases adjust to the needs and motives of their members. So conservative policy returns decisions and risks to the people who are most affected by them because that's how you create homeostatic systems. So here we are opposing the local against the global, power to the people, light a candle in the corner where you live. That's kind of what Burke talked about, right? What else does this remind you of? These institutions, these intermediate voluntary authorities, the autonomous associations and the local community groups. The Tocqueville? No, well, Nisbet? Kinda. I'm, I'm looking for something a little more Burkean. We've already talked a little bit about the little platoons. This is what we're focused on here, the little platoons of Edmund Burke. Here's how he put it. He said, to be attached to the, to the subdivision, to love the little platoon we belong to in society, is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of public affections. It is the first link in a series by which we proceed towards love to the country and to mankind. The interest of that portion of social arrangement is a trust in the hands of all who compose it. And as none but bad men would justify it in abuse, none but traitors would barter it away for their own personal advantage. The point is that all of our real affections start at home and build out from there. Anybody who tries to say, well, we can have this love of mankind that will solve the problems of particularity are, are very wrong-headed. So here we have arrived at the heart of conservatism, home and its defense against all destroyers. It is the, these little platoons of life that build up the social capital of society, and it is top-down state controls and special interest political groups that often eat up and devour this political capital. So central to all of Scruton's philosophy is the home. That's why we call him the philosopher of the home. Oikos is the term that he has uh, renewed. This word appears in Latinate forms in the words economy. There's the oikos, economics. Uh, economics is actually home economy. It's redundant. And he suggests that we will neither solve our environmental <coughs> nor economic problems until we have put the oikos back into the economy and the ecology. Oikophilia, or love of home, 
is the thing that strikes chords in the hearts of men as it is the motivation that wells up from the deep stratum of human psychology. It is the key term of his book, Oikophilia. Oikophilia is the source of many of our most generous and self-sacrificing gestures. Our, our, our capacity to love, our capacity to love, is critically dependent on whether we find this core experience of home in our home. And with the increasing breakup of the family that communicates really only the lack of commitment, our national stock of oikophilia is being depleted. This love of home, the family, the community, and the little platoons within it are, for scrutiny, the only real way to save the planet because we care more about our own place than any other. The radical environmentalists neglect the fundamental experience of home, place, and community, instead to find themselves through global agendas, global agendas, international initiatives, and the worldwide mobilization of the enlightened. And thereupon, uh, thereby, they uproot the very cause they claim to serve, namely, the search for roots. The effect of radical policies is not the improvement of the environment, but rather, they bind the world to top-down edicts, install bureaucracies, all unaccountable and unresponsive to local conditions. And they're all rotten with corruption and unintended consequences. Rather than nurture oikophilia or the love of home, they often are oikophobic, oikophobic and undo the local structures that are the real strength of any homostatic system. Scruton excoriates the cult of repudiation. And when he talks about the cult of repudiation, this is a theme that goes throughout almost all of his books. The, the idea of the progressive move, movement that seeks to kill the past, to discredit our Western heritage or, to, or its established institutions, customs, and traditions. It seeks to uproot us from family ways of life. And uh, it, it's trying to repudiate that family values and our need for community, our need to be homish, our search, our quest for home, our quest for community, as Robert Nisbet would say. The oikophobe, instead of cherishing his place and its particulars, defines his political vision in terms of universal values that have been purged of all reference to particular attachments of historic, historical community. In other words, the oikophobes are defenders of an enlightened universalism against local chauvinism. So oikophobes see a, uh, they seek a fulcrum outside of their society by which they can overturn the settled foundations of an established order. That idea of them using a fulcrum outside of our society to overturn our long-held and enduring moral order. The problem with international treaties, of course, is that they're only as effective as the ability and willingness to be bound by them. And this ability of states varies vastly from one country to the next. When the U.S. ratifies a treaty, this represents a huge cost to us and to our businesses and to our people. When the Chinese sign a treaty, <laughs> it's very unclear who's going to pay or how. And so it usually devolves into a dog and pony show where they appear to be complying, but in reality they are just merely evading the agreement altogether and taking advantage of the, the better competitive position. They are, um, here are a couple quick, quick examples I'd like to mention. First is the evidence in England where the uh, countryside, and Russell Kirk writes about um, some of this in, in his book, The Intemperate Professor. The English countryside has been preserved in a pristine condition, though England has experienced a tenfold population increase since 1800. Um, the government, however, in England backed plans for urban renewal that would have torn down the old buildings, the old homes. It, it, it promoted industrial farming, the breakup of the small farms, that, and they would have mutilated the old farms and the stringent zoning requirements that favor big business over mom and pop stores. Um, their co England's countryside was saved by the little platoons, the hundreds of little associations against the state, against the state. They say that the rivers were rescued from government. Property rights. It was the folks downriver who were protecting their property that were able to stand up, combine and stand up against the big polluters. Not the, not the government. So without property rights and the rule of law, we and our environment are defenseless against the big polluters. Consider the ecological disasters of our ghettos. There's no oikophilia there because there's little ownership. 
although few people have jobs, but apparently plenty of free time, there is, uh, there's signs everywhere that the ghetto is steeped in squalor. Why? Because they see themselves as tenants. It's someone else's job. There's no oikophilia. They, they have no love of home. It's someone else's job to clean up the place. Remember, as problems pass to government, they pass out of our hands. Another example is Romania, sobering proof that without civil associations animated by Okephilia, no environment can be saved. The European U Union, now uh, in the post ceausescu years, now oversees the environment and waste problems, and the Romanians no longer have the motive to do anything for their country. But the trash clotting their rivers, the vast tracts of poisoned land simply remind the Romanian <laughs> that the whole problem has been confiscated by bureaucrats from elsewhere. These are the examples that show the folly of the schemes of uh, run by top heavy government rather than widespread oikophilia. Government's job shouldn't be to solve all these problems, but rather um, to make room for the little platoons so that people can solve the problems for themselves. This is the whole reason conservatives favor decentralization and subsidiarity. By spreading power and authority widely, homeostasis is achieved, which is resilient to the shocks. Think of a wide mattress on a box spring um, absorbing shocks, whereas top-down government edicts cannot maintain their equilibrium. The balance is too tough to hold, and they're often brittle and vulnerable to a variety of nefarious forces that can easily topple the system and cause the whole thing to collapse. But with widespread homeostatic systems, these pressures can um, that, that can cause the entire top-down solutions to fail, or actually worsen the problem, with, with widespread homeostatic systems, these cause no more disruption and discomfort than the pea pod under a mattress. So, mental image for you there. Now, let me address the keystone of the problem as Scruton sees it, and that is the externalization of costs. Governments, business, people, we all attempt to externalize our costs. That is, we try to shed our costs and pass them on to others. Waste is the primary kind of externalization, but also consider industrial farming, a major target of Wendell Berry's. Um, industrial farming has scraped the land of its topsoil and replaced it with a chemical <coughs> veneer. These costs may not be felt for generations, but they are nearly irreparable. Scruton makes clear that what is required in any homeostatic system, whether social, material, or economic, is feedback loops. Feedback loops. We waste because it costs us so little, to externalize our cost. There are no f negative feedback loops. We are not made to bear the cost of our pollution ourselves, but we can pass them on to others. It's a big intergenerational game of pass, pass the trash. Scruton sets his sights um, on plastic, in particular, what he calls the immortal rubbish that is filling our landfills and causing an island of floating rubbish in the Pacific Ocean that Scruton says is twice the size of Texas. But we externalize the cost of plastic because, it, to us, it's cheaper than biodegradable alternatives. He also points out that plastic packaging is also a tool of mega corporations against the mob pots. The multinationals and supermarket chains have pushed for packaging standards that only the big companies can comply with. So in addition to polluting our earth, plastic is helping destroy the local economy. Scruton cites the old glass bottle deposit system as the best Burkean way of preserving our bequest rather than of devouring it. Were we to price the lasting damage of our plastic and add that cost to the end price for the consumer, biodegradable packaging could then retrench in our economy and our environment and our descendants would be the benefactors. That's the whole point of feedback loops. The person or the business bears the cost of action himself and thereby the cost is widely and properly distributed and absorbed and gives motives for conservation in the old motive of simply saving on money. This is why Scruton urges a simple flat carbon tax, the proceeds of which would be used to fund alternative energy research that will enable us, enable us to become independent of finite, pro, finite fossil fuels. Now, <clears throat> I'll stop here and say that. No, normally I always say, no, 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 we don't need to fund alternative research because whoever whoever comes up with the, the alternative for, for gasoline is going to strike it rich. It's, a, it's the way I always felt until I read this book. 
the normal market incentives to research and development don't exist, Scruton says, when it comes to developing alternative energy because it's unlikely that the inventor would recoup uh, any of the profits of discovery and cover his costs because the, of the difficulty to patent such an idea. This is the one place that Scruton makes for the state, the development of alternative energy. He pretty much thinks that windmills are a scam and a vandalism on our landscapes, <coughs> but he still holds out some hope for solar and other renewable energies. But Scruton's key point here is that this must be done unilaterally uh, by nations that can, a coalition of the willing, rather than some Kyoto Treaty that forces deprivation on all, all of us. In conclusion, the conservative understanding of political action that Scruton proposes is formulated in terms of trusteeship rather than enterprise, of conversation rather than command, and that of friendship rather than the pursuit of some common cause. He says, those ideas lend themselves readily to the environmental project, and it always surprises me that so few environmentalists seem to see this. It is obvious to a conservative that our reckless pursuit of individual gratification jeopardizes the social order as it jeopardizes the planet. It is obvious, too, that the wisest policies are those that strive to keep in place the customs and institutions that place a break on our appetites, that renew sources of social contentment, contentment and forbid us to pass on the cost of what we do to those who do not incur them. Rational self-interest is not the motive that will solve our problems of externalizing our costs. The only motive that can do that is the natural motive of the shared love of a shared place. That, it seems to me, says Scruton, is the goal to which serious environmentalism and serious conservatism both point, namely to home, that place that defines us, that place we hold in trust for our descendants, and that place we don't want to spoil, but rather we want to enhance and cherish. Thank you very much.